ahead and just get this thing going here. And we are good to go. And uh, so how about you introduce yourself to everybody, who you are and why we're on today? Uh, my name is James Konzolka. Uh, Tony from Vela Cards uh, <laughs> reached out and wanted me to come on and do be like one of the participants in his uh, champion series. That's and I wanted to come in and talk about what I can recall, I may miss some things because it's quite a quite a long time ago. But uh, well, you wrote up a great you wrote up a great review of your of your run. I read uh, the other night. Uh, last night I read it. Uh, really long, detailed review of your championship, all your matches. Oh well, okay. Oh yeah. No, I, it's it, it it was a a great time back then for us because we had a huge community and there was you could always play. We'd have over 50 plus people every single weekend playing in our weekly tournaments. Now you guys played at a place because I noticed, you know, uh, called Dark Towers. Yep. And that is, uh, that seemed to be a, like the, like home at majority of radio players would come in the East Coast, in the upper Northeast. Yeah, I, I started working there um, in the early 2000s. And Joe, the, one of the main owners there at the time, Joe Dietz, he was just like, all right, we got to figure out some main product to push that we both enjoy that when somebody walks in the door, we can just start playing and we both enjoyed wrestling somewhat. And so we just started pushing it. And then soon over time, we were getting 50 plus people tournaments every single weekend. Now for like a game store for magic, you're like 20 to 30. You're like, that's pretty good for your regular like customer base. I mean, we were, we were getting so we were getting people from New York traveling a couple hours just to come and play every weekend. It was it was a whole different type of community. It was our own little sub community, but it was just a great place to belong. Where, where in New Jersey is that at? Or was it uh, at? It, it was in Denville, Denville, New Jersey. So they ended up making a Denville, New Jersey card yeah. off of it, which is funny because the way that card got made uh, was Foley, Mike Foley, one of the things he always talked about uh, with us, because Baron and Foley would come down about once every month or two. And Foley would always say, you guys just play all these red wall decks. So you just want to reverse everything and control way too much control. And, I, and that was an issue for the game as it got older. But he, so he was like, I just want to get rid of a lot of the red cards and decks. So he was just, let's make Denville, New Jersey. We'll make it so people got to pull out all these reversal cards so that <laughs> your, your decks skim down and you can get beat quicker. So it was, it was pretty funny, like knock from Foley to give us a card with through it, which was cool though, you know. Did you play, and you got into the game from the very beginning or at what release did you get into? Uh, so it, I might've got in right at the end of premiere, uh, right beginning of fully loaded somewhere in that time frame. There was another was local store where I started working that at uh, dark tower that introduced me new world manga. And then um, from there, it was just like, all right, let's just play. Let's just have fun. And, and for, for me, there's a, there's a big tie in for me with raw deal because when I left school, I had Lyme disease and part of my healing process recovering was through gaming. And so Rod Deal became like a huge part of my healing process moving forward in life. And it definitely made, um, it made it an easier transition. And I found a, a loving community to get involved in that really just made it a, a smooth transition. Well, you did pretty well with it too. Yeah, it worked out. It worked out. <laughs> where, where did you where did you peak out ranking wise? One. Uh, so in the year before I won the the world championship, uh, I was the top ranked player. That's how I qualified for worlds that previous year. So I I, I made a a Bubba deck, uh, the premier raw superstar Bubba Ray Dudley, primarily because the challenge was everybody thought X-Pac and Bubba were the two worst superstars. So it was like, we, yeah, we, we covered that by the way, in our backlash <laughs> one. And those were the two low ranked uh, superstars. Yeah. And, and, and uh, so I had worked on this deck and I'm like, Oh, this is awesome. This is a combo deck. There was no volley. This, there was no cow on ice at the time. So it's just like, if you're going off, you're going off. The only answer was JBI. And uh, so I had this deck and I go undefeated all the way into the finals for the Wizard <laughs> World Philly East qualifier. And I'm playing against my buddy, uh, Andrew Trebbing, uh, you know, some amazing friends that I met through the time. And he was playing a Los Cheese deck. He ended up uh, winning the event, rightfully deserved to. And, uh, but I, I remember going like, man, okay, 
I didn't get it there. So that year became like a chase to become the number ranked player because I was like, if I'm, if I'm crushing and I'm losing in the finals, that's going to be my only path. So I got qualified for that year prior. And then I, I got destroyed in the top four worlds the pre previous year. So that led me into uh, 2000. I, I don't remember which year it is. Maybe it's 2006. 2006 was the year that you won. Yeah. So in, in that year, I, there was an interesting chase that happened for me. It was like uh, that Gen Con qualifier. I think Elijah Jones won it. And I, I, I couldn't get far enough with the premier raw Goldberg that I had at the time. And then uh, neutral ground, I lost. Uh, I didn't do well. I played with like a Stacy Keebler heavy diversion deck. Um, yeah, I saw that in your report that that was a, probably a deck that you were going to go back to for world championships, but you uh, skipped that one. And I think you chose Doink instead. Yes, yes. So the Canadian qualifier that got me there, I ended up going last minute. Not I drove up like the night before. I was just like, screw it, I'm gonna go do it. I gotta get qualified. This is when you're this is when you're in your 20s and you're yeah. just so addicted yeah. and want to like you, your your ego is just driving you way too hard. You know? <laughs> That's true. And uh, and so I just drive up there and play the Premier Raw Goldberg and it ended up working out, you know. Uh, obviously it was a great time, played against Craig Ewing in the finals and um but after that, it was like a huge sigh of relief because it's like, I just wanted to get back to Worlds. I had basically blacked out about what had happened in the previous year because it was not traumatizing, but you're just like, when you face, you work so hard for something in life and you put in so much time and you suffer defeat, you're like- But you made top four. Yeah, it, it was good. Like, and, 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 and in 2005, you made top four out of how many people played in the World Championships? Uh, I, I think 16. I, I think they invited only the top 16. I'm not, I'm not certain how, uh, I can't recall from that time, but, um, for, for then when it came to time for the, the world championship, it was, uh, it was, I, I was, I was happy with Doink because it was trying to approach the game from a different angle. And like any way I've ever played games in the past, mm -hmm. I'm all about like, once people figure out what axis is to play the game on, I want to change and find alternate axes so that like, if I get blocked out, I still have outs to win. Mm -hmm. Or if they're playing one game, I can just decide to play in a different way. And the game does not mesh well for how they want to play. Yeah. And that's what Doink did. And Doink was just like, cool, I don't care. I just want to block them out of their other stuff. Most people just played a lot of actions and stuff that were non-zeros. So like you're, you're, you're blocking them out after that point. <laughs> That's all the plan was with Doink. And as long as I had a finish, I, I, I don't remember what the finish was, but. Yeah, and cause uh, you went in and then uh, I can't, I have to go back. I had the reports too and I can't find them now. I'm gonna, I'm gonna find them eventually. But you wrote a great detail of your run from 2006. Uh, I guess the first part was uh, you played all access first. Then, okay. Then you played Afterburn after that, I think it was. So I think Doink was, Doink was your Afterburn deck. Yes. And the Heat, yes. Seekers, were, were Heat Seekers were your all access deck. Right, right. So there's, uh, uh, there at Dark Tower, we had our own little subgroups. Some of the guys from New York, there was the Poison Clan game, uh, <laughs> PCG, right? Yeah. And um, they would come out, some, you know, you'd have Mark LaRoche every now and then would come out and visit. And then some of the local uh, teenagers at Dark Tower, they were like, they were pretty good for their, they were pretty damn good for their age. It was like Justin Canner, Andrew Snyder, and, and a whole bunch of those guys. And they ended up, uh, so they ended up making a team name called MCG Medicine Clan Gaming. So they <laughs> wanted to like rival Poison Clan, but it's these young teenagers who are just like kind of trolling and being playful and like, you know, it, it was pretty funny, but they were pretty good. But so <laughs> one of them had been, playing a Heat Seekers deck a bunch of weekends at Tower. And I was just like, I was trying to keep an eye out. And like, I had gravitated to the point of, so the game was at Volley This and Cow on Ice existed. And I was like, man, is there still a way to play a combo deck with these cards in existence that I can still push through? And it seemed like the Heat Seekers, what I was seeing seemed pretty promising. And so I took a, a, a large chunk of the basis for that deck from those, the MCG team. I think Matt Gagliano was playing it for a decent amount. That, that's who it was. 
but um and and it just seemed like it was a combo deck that that uh it was almost unstoppable it felt like so i just kept wanting to jam it and once you start playing games with a certain deck it doesn't matter the game once you're familiar with the deck and if you're just not losing with it even if you don't love the deck to begin with, you're like, I think I just got to play this thing. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's on autopilot at that point. I mean, it's like, yeah. it's, I got to go. So. <laughs> yeah, so you ran those decks like that. I mean, how comfortable, because your article you wrote up about your 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 run there that year was, you were a little hesitant to play. Uh, it sounded like both decks. Like, you were still kind of on the fence of running Stacy or not. Yeah, so like getting crushed with the Stacy deck in that New York qualifier really... Um, made me second guess what my instincts were telling me. Like you just following your intuition where you see power level. And like the thing with Stacy, you were playing with a smaller deck. So it, it actually did have significant relevance to uh, when you're going to get pinned or counted out a lot quicker, like not as much weight was being put on that initially. So I was losing games and I was like, Oh man, I felt like I pretty much had control of this game now. And then I just lost. So I wanted to kind of like, back off of it i had also played Heyman the previous worlds oh. it was like a foreign objects deck and it once again it was another smaller deck and it was it was good but or i don't know if it was a smaller deck i can't recall i can't recall on that uh, um but i just remember it falling short it would fall short and i was just like man the power's there but it's just not winning enough and so i was losing confidence in what decks to play, as opposed to like previously, I played two man power trip for like three years nonstop. You know, Raw Deal was the game where you claimed you wanted a superstar yeah. and then you tried to to like spit it from the mountaintop so that everybody knew you were gonna play this character. So everybody else was like, well, I don't wanna play him at the big event because then diversity rule, I might get knocked out. So it was like, you needed to monopolize saying you're playing a character at a big event coming up. Yeah, it was very weird, like politics of the game at the time. But uh, the <laughs> so Triple H and then Bubba was so good, and then I, I kept going down the chain. The Premier Rock Goldberg was pretty good, and then I just kind of like was getting to this. Well, I hadn't played enough because once I qualified, I was more about like wanting to develop the community at, at Dark Tower and like the game there. And then- Which seemed to be doing well anyway. It was doing really well. Oh man, D Dark Tower, we ended up every pre-release, every release event, re release weekend that would come out for Raw Deal, we would have like almost 30 cases of Raw Deal <laughs> that would be sold in that first weekend. So I would, I would literally, how far away was comic images from that store? I mean, 35, 40 minutes. So I would drive down the comic images, load up a truck or Joe would. And then we come back and we'd be like, all right, man, I wish we could have gotten more, but you know, <laughs> there's always so much room in the car. Yeah, it was, it was, it was pretty awesome. But so I didn't have a ton of confidence. I had confidence in the heat, heat seekers deck a, a decent amount from seeing what happened, but doink felt like a risk play, but I felt like, if, if you're going to be able to stop people from doing other things that their decks are relying on so heavily, it should, it should automatically close out the game to how you want to go. So I was just like, you know, I'm just going to take a risk. Plus, uh, Doink was one of my favorite wrestlers in a weird way. Not, his off, not off of the, uh, you know, the screen and, and, and in the industry, but uh, more so Doink and Gold. I'm like a Doink Gold Dust guy as a fan, you know? <laughs> Did you ever play Gold Dust? Uh, a little bit. I think uh, initially we played when I forget what set that it was when when Gold Dust came out, but maybe that was Velocity. But uh, he no. he was decent. He was decent. But uh, I think Virtual made him much better, which is what he always needed. You were always waiting for a new superstar specific to come out to enhance some previous superstar. You're like, oh, are they going to be playable? Are they finally going to be playable? And uh, eventually, some guys really didn't need it. I mean, did Triple H really need that many cards? Did you know uh, those premier guys didn't need as many cards as they got? Well, it, it's interesting. So, like in play testing, so we started play testing at Dark Tower. We started coming in around uh, Vengeance. So you were on the play testing team too. Yeah, we started play testing in Vengeance because of uh, Baron basically saw the Bubba deck and. Uh, a couple other things. Trebbing was doing really well at events. Blair Thompson was doing really well, really well at events. So we were just like, he's like, I want to get your guys' opinion on stuff. And half half the times, Baron would 
I'd see him in an event and he'd be like, Hey James, you know, you, you ruined this card, right? Cause like, <laughs> we, we would like be trying to power down shit or stuff. Sorry. Yeah, you, um, <laughs> whatever you like, man. <laughs> so we would be trying to power it down and we get resistance granted. To be fair, we weren't the best at, uh, we're young 20 something kids. We weren't the best at fully communicating through written communication, you know, how to, how we should probably correct things or go into a deeper analysis. Uh, and, but that at, at in vengeance, I mean, like we got Cal to have cannot be packed by Ric Flair on it. Um, leader of the edge army and, uh, highlight of the night were mainly there to like slow down the combo decks. Mm -hmm. uh but that those are like baron and foley's designs that did that uh but i'm getting a little off, tr off track here oh, no, no, uh, that's great. That's great. um but yeah so so for worlds that year i mean i was just so committed to one it, it's it's i think it's like anything in life for anyone it, as long as you put in a ton of work and it's you're gonna put in the, the work. And I'm talking about what you think you have in your head is the work. Yeah. It's more than that, you know? Uh, you, you have the five Ps, proper planning, prevents piss poor performances. Yeah, right. <laughs> That's what it's all about. It's just like- How, how much time from. leading up to Worlds before you get to Worlds, how, how many days and nights were you play testing and, and building your deck and fine tuning? So I was fortunate th to be working at a game store at the time, right? So like helping run Dark Tower, every day you, I'd have different customers who come in and you get to like talk about whatever's going on with the game decks and stuff like that. And you'd get to hear so many other opinions and different perspectives. So, you know, even though I may be inclined to like something that is more combo rific or uh, doesn't die to action hate as easily, uh, other people may be like, listen, I'm just pounding maneuvers with this and it's going through just different angles and views. And so like so many different people, I'd have over like 20, 30 people every week come in. I'd play a game or two with them when they came in to yeah. visit and we'd be chatting and discussing different ideas. It would just give a more robust viewpoint and understanding of the game. You're like, hold on, stop it real quick. I got to go over there and ring that guy out. Hold <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that basically is what happened almost all the time. But- uh, I'll get my car, I'll be right back. <laughs> but- uh, it, it was it was really like a, a combination of the opportunity existed, the the work effort was there, the the input from others was there, and then it's a matter of fine tweaking as it gets closer and closer to the event. Like I kind of wanted to be locked into a deck. Usually historically, I wanted to be locked into a deck a month before an event that I targeted an event with. Mm -hmm. So that I can just be like, this is the deck I'm playing. Now let's optimize this as much as possible. And yeah, don't, that's where- don't, don't, When you do that, don't you end up facing, I mean, I'm certain a lot of the guys in your store and your area that you're going to see at Worlds. Yeah. 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 I think your report was, uh, again, I can't find it. I'm using that way back then because you can't find raw deal sites anymore. But um, your report says something about a buddy of yours. You're kind of hoping to face you in the, in the finals. <laughs> I, I, I don't remember. I don't remember. Maybe uh, there was somebody that uh, a buddy of yours that you guys wanted to face off against. Mark each other. LaRoche, maybe. Possibly. Uh, possibly. I, I think, yeah, there was like LaRoche or Trebbing or Blair Thompson. Yeah. Like those, those would have, those would have been the guys that I was communicating heavily with about the game at the but time. You, so, but close friends too. How do you, I mean, you, you, you're going to play in a game in a tournament that you're playing against people that you're, that's helping you play test your deck on a week at week basis. Yeah. So how does that work when you get to worlds like that? You know each other's decks. <laughs> well, so there, it, there, it's a double edged sword, right? Yeah. So if you, if you only put in a decent amount of work and some preparation and you're like, okay, at least I've gotten the feedback, then other people are aware of what you're doing. And then that might get out or whatever, you know, the, the whole leaks concept, you know, of what your ideas and strategies are. Your getting. ideas, but even at the event itself, you got so many people who are scouting all the time too, so. Right, right. But you're also not gonna get access to information and eyes viewing those, those spots. I'll call them spots, because it's usually the joke with, uh, that people make fun of with me about like playtesting for games. Because I always try to play to one or two spots in a matchup and then gain that advantage there. Uh -huh. So, but 
you, you're going to find out about certain spots and then how they're reacting to those spots. And that's their like metagame call. So like, I don't want to go too deep into a, another metagame leveling, but if I know they're going to respond a certain way by putting my stuff out there, then I'll know how to react if I've, if I've had enough experience with it. So it's really trying to not go too many steps forward, but just be one step ahead. Once you see how people are going to re respond to what you're doing. So you get in that, in that format. So let's, uh, you, you get to worlds. Uh, here it is. It's, I assume it takes place on a Saturday, like normal. I think so. Yeah. And, uh, so you get there and, uh, you guys are going to start. I mean, how many people are playing in the year that you, it's still what, 16 players again, uh, probably in 2006. So there's 16 of you starting in this format. Uh, who in that, the, you, do you have somebody in mind? Like, this is a person I don't want to face. Yeah. Um, I got to pull up the list. Uh, I, I know that you end up playing uh, in the finals against Frankie Ho. Oh, I, I mean, Frankie Ho would obviously be. So he was the previous year's world champion. Um, okay. Yeah, I mean, you just didn't know what to expect. Usually, um, unlike some other card games, Raw Deal, there was only a couple of events whenever a new set came out. So innovation got rewarded. Uh, but you also wouldn't know what to expect from a lot of the Singapore guys, the Chilean guys, the uh, people from the UK. It's like different environments. But in the US, you would usually hear about uh, feedback of what, what the metagame was or, or what people were playing. And um, but I, I yeah, Frankie Ho, because I think I remember going, I don't truly recall all of the previous year. Uh, of, of the world from the previous world championship. Mm -hmm. But I just remember being like, man, I felt good. I thought at the time going into that top four and then just getting, I think I went like, Oh, and three. Cause it was like round Robin. Everybody played everybody once. And then I, something else. And I went like, Oh, and three. So I just got like decimated that year. And I remember Frankie Ho, like, I was just like, woof. And then I think I think in the year that that I ended up winning, I think in the regular rounds I lost to Frankie Ho, and because um, you went, uh, yeah, you, you lost one game against him. I think it was he. He was your only loss. Oh, okay. Yeah, but it, it's a, a, a lot of the work went in. It was also different. I felt a little more confident because if we were playing constructed, I felt better. The previous year they did. Uh, constructed so I think it was only all access existed at the time and then they did raw draft which you know it there, I mean there's a lot of variants it's like limited format there is significant variance and raw deal for raw draft was significant variance because most starter decks were only having one elbow to the face in it you know and stuff like that one elbow to the face wow it's like a staple nowadays like every, no matter what it's a staple card you have to pack at least two even with all the virtual stuff that's out right now, it's like uh, there's st still certain classic stuff that are like just staple cards you have to have, which is like, I guess, uh, you know, uh, Eric is now the, uh, you know, the lead designer for the new virtual stuff going forward. And uh, I had him on to talk about virtual and how he kind of assumed the role from, from creeds like that and the, uh, what he has planned for the future. So there's, there's a, supposed to be a, a giant shift in the game of how people are packing decks that, you know, I, as I'm part of that, where I see, I can see, I don't contribute in any way, but I still see what's going on, but I haven't viewed it enough to see what that major shift is. So they're kind of like a whole, like, mm -hmm, let's see what's happening kind of thing. <laughs> um, but to hear that you only pack, you know, pack one uh, elbow of the face in the deck, it just seems so hilarious to me. Well, I, I, I think what Eric's trying to do with the game, and first of all, big time kudos to Nate and Creed for what they did for the past decade or more, more than a decade to, to help keep the 12, game. 12 going. years. Yeah. That's a long time and a lot of work. And so amazed with what they've done and I'm excited to see what Eric does. And I think, you know, I come from a different perspective where, you know, in testing, I want to tone down numbers and stuff, but in creating, I, I'm more for splashier designs stuff that's going to make people want to play and be like, oh, that's awesome. I get to play with this old card again that wasn't playable. Yeah. Anything. And they made it playable through this design. That should be awesome. Yeah. That's um, my, I, my only design that I've ever done is uh, I, I helped develop about 80, 85% of Revolution 4. Nice. Rev, Rev was my, was my thing. So I sat many nights 
uh, with my partner, now my business partner, Mike, and we sat there and just coming up with ideas and using pieces of paper or post notes and put it in a sleeve just like that and play the game. Like, how can we make this card in Rev 1 that nobody plays? How can we make that relevant? Oh, that'd be great for like, can you imagine if we had like a Revolution Seamus or a Revolution, you know, uh, uh, Santino? And so we, we developed all those things. So, you know, I, I helped develop, uh, I made Revolution Carlito, The Rock, uh, you know, we had all these different uh, ideas. So a lot of thought process goes into making that stuff. And I, I don't, I don't envy any of these guys who do this on, uh, as much as they do. I, Creed doing the amount of work that he did in the beginning where he handled almost everything by himself. Uh, I, I can't fathom doing that. So that it's so uh, but, much work. Yeah. And, and, and just like, there's a decision that needs to get made and somebody has to make a decision yep. and like, you know, probably one of the most crucial times in Raw Deal. I remember, uh, I think I was up in Rhode Island at the time. I think I was visiting La Roche or maybe, was it Rhode Island? Yeah, somewhere in the Boston area, maybe. And I remember driving home and sometimes I would stop in Connecticut over at Foley's place. And I don't know if Baron was there at the time, but this is right after or right before Great American Bash is getting released. And I remember Foley uh, chatting with me and he's like, uh, the game's going to change, you know? And like, he told, like, this was the whole revolution process, you know? And it's like, they had to make a decision because sales were declining and, it, you know, nobody wanted to read a paragraph in order to play a game off of every single card. Right. The game needed to be more simplified. And there were certain things, like, they had good weight in their decisions they might have just been rushed to make a decision in a certain time frame to get product out and it was hard once i heard that news i was just like there was a you know at first it was uh probably except i, I was still learning to accept that there was going to be that change mm -hmm. and i think because i think a lot of people's initial reactions to revolution wasn't good back then uh well, but it's not, not great today unfortunately yeah, yeah. But I think that's because of the time, like a lot of people had became so committed to the game. And then it was such a change and people just, it changes rough. Yeah. And, but when he told, when he told me that it, it's, it's, you're like, okay, stuff's really going to change now. I don't know. I don't like this. You know, that was the initial response. And then, but, you know, stuff got baked into how they decided to design, like they made the aggression rule because they didn't want people playing red wall decks, just sitting there reversing and playing, yeah. you know, mind games and stuff. And I, but I, was, I was all for it. I mean, um, I, I, I was like most uh, because I was at the time revolution came out, I was already kind of heavily into it running events. Uh, I was co-running events with Adam Kreitz and nice. uh, then it kind of took over from after he passed. Uh, but uh, I was kind of, I was a little resistant to revolution. I thought this is different. I just, I just started feeling comfortable with classic stuff, you know, finally, you know, getting a few wins under my belt, you know, kind of thing and kind of feeling good. Like a dumb guy like me could probably figure this shit out now. And, uh, and then um, revolution came out and I kind of was resistant about it. And I remember when Albert, Albert Rubio went to go play in, in the world championships and uh, he had to learn revolution as well. So I kind of gained a little bit of interest because he had interest in trying to buy some cards from me, figuring out the mechanics and how it really works like that. Uh, and the timings on, I go, oh, it's not so bad after all. So I got less reading. It's faster pace. I could probably get three or four games in the time it takes you guys to play one classic game. <laughs> I mean, they, they did it right. They, fig or they did it right to a certain extent. They had to make a change to increase sales, and they needed to make the game simpler. The, the spot where maybe if more of us were, you know, this is where I feel partially – uh, not, I'm not heavily responsible for the game. Please don't take it as, as that. But it's like, if in play testing, if there could have been more emphasis to bleed and blend the revolution cards into the classic format at the mm -hmm. time, I think it would have been accepted a lot easier if there was a higher percentage of the cards cross breeding in. You, you think know? it would have been better like that for an all access standpoint? Cause all access gets uh, shit on uh, big time, uh, almost as bad as, uh, as revolution as a format. <laughs> I, I think it's. Uh, I think there's a lot of abusive, powerful things that can occur in the format. And oh God, yes. The, the catalog and the library of cards and everything is just so m massive that uh, it's just it's just too much. You know. Should there have been a ban? Should there have been a ban list at some point? 
like in Magic? Like, yeah, Andre, like, Andre the Giant like, should have been banned right off the bat. I'm talking, uh, I'm talking like I know my shit when it comes to that, but I don't know any other game but Rod Deal. I, I, don't, I don't have any any knowledge of how Magic is played or Yu-Gi-Oh or Pokemon. I've only known Rod Deal. So my, my connections to other games and how other games function, how they do things and run events is very, very nothing. I only know Rod Deal. But I keep hearing terms like, there should have been a ban list like in Magic or a ban list like that. Uh, should that have happened in Raw Deal? Yeah. I, so we were play testing for Great American Bash, and Andre got revealed to us, and we 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 were like, "This is ridiculous." Now there there are other caveats to this that we weren't privy to that I think most people weren't privy to. Like that was the last classic set made. Andre the Giant is iconic in wrestling history. So I can understand wanting him to be one of the most powerful superstars in the game. I'm fine with that concept. Maybe the design, uh, the design was, we, I remember at Dark Tower, we were just, we kept saying in our playtests, we were like, this, this is so overpowered. Now, were you guys play testing it back when, because a little thing that I didn't know about uh, was that, you know, his, his power, his ability used to be even worse, like stronger than it is now. I, I don't know which version got revealed to us because we, we, I don't know if we were, we weren't always in on the, the 1.1 of testing. We would usually come in at the 1.5 or the 2.0 or so, you know, somewhere along the, the, the process later than the initial starting point. And I just remember, we just remember seeing him and we just, we had, we were not, ha we, we thought it was too powerful. Um, but, uh, you know, we're also 20 something year old kids. So maybe there's not stuff that we're, or, or young adults, I shouldn't say yeah. kids, uh, but just stuff we're not privy to. But it, I, I remember they didn't do anything to change it. It was just too powerful. So the next year, I remember the reason why I got qualified for worlds the following year was because I was like, I don't understand how this got let. So I'm just going to play Andre heat and one neutral ground qualifier to qualify for next year's worlds because of andre even after like animately saying this is busted this is busted this, this can't be the way it needs to be but you know i mean that there's also other stuff with that where in play testing we would put up a stink about certain cards and sometimes i would i would i would be the one who uh would dumb down cards and baron put a little baron and foley put a little faith in me in regards to uh some of my feedback and just like revolutionizing the business or forget what the card was there was stephanie mcmahon mm -hmm. dominated pump kick suicide lariat era yeah. and that card originally should have been like you well, know she had uh two cards that came out uh the bitches back or something like that and then yeah. uh like billion dollar princess throwback but there, there was there was plenty of cards that i like i said baron would be like james you ruined this card this card's not even playable now, you know? And it was just like, we, we were so focused on certain spots of where the game had evolved to that you just didn't want that negative play experience to continue. So what was your involvement? Like how, how did you communicate a lot with someone like Creed? Cause Creed was on the play testing committee for that stuff. Like he was one of the main play testers for Great American Bash. I think Creed was on before, like I think we joined in after Creed had already been in because he's doing, you know, rules design and um, and play testing too. You know, everybody's got their different play testing groups. But also, to be fair, like we're all play testing groups. I think we were all doing it out of a volunteer, you know, uh, mindset because we were just happy to do it and be involved in the process. And we wanted the game to can keep going on. We loved the game. And uh, but, I Creed was definitely in before us at uh, uh, through a lot of the processes. Yeah, because I uh, we we talked about that. So I, when we did our breakdown for our Great American Bash, there was a lot of stuff talked about uh, their involvement. But um, he was the one that revealed that uh, you should have seen his ability when it was originally created. It's like that. It was just like, <laughs> it was worse than what it is. You know, it ended up being. So if you think it's a big pile, broken, broken pile of shit as it is now, it's like that. It wasn't even worse then. <laughs> but uh, so let's go back to your run here real quick. So I, actually, oh, yeah. I, I pull I pull up your write up. I fi I found it. So it's a very extensive write-up you had it's like that. So you, you get into you, you played all access first. That was that was your breakdown for all access. So you played in round one. You played against Joe Stemp. Stempek. Stempek. Yeah, he plays a, as a Bobby Heenan deck. Okay. 
Uh, I don't want to go back and read everything, you know, reread everything so I guess, but do you have any memories of that, like that first, this is your first matchup going into Worlds now. You got to be a little nervous. Uh, yeah, I, uh, so I don't recall. <laughs> <laughs> I know that Bobby the Brain Heenan at the time was uh, one of the top decks there. I think An Andrew Trebbing played a Heenan deck for a while or uh, Heenan and Teddy were the two main decks because Bobby gave you hand information the whole time. Yeah. So you always got to see your opponent's hand. So um, that, that was definitely a concern. Yeah, he, he, so he's placed uh, Heenan. He uses Triple H as an enforcer. Okay. And so, uh, you know, he's going to do his, his all about, you know, uh, it's all about the game, of course, with Terry Reynolds in play. So, but it you, you kind of looks like from the write-ups like that, you kind of smoked through right there and went 1-0 right there. <laughs> then you end up playing uh, Anthony Escobar and playing his Teddy Long deck. Uh, it's funny to say Teddy. <laughs> yep, yep. So, and that's even a shorter write-up. So it tells me that this was even a shorter match. <laughs> okay. Okay. So you go up 2 and 0. Then you face uh, Anthony uh, Ogden. Okay. Was he that the Florida? He played in Florida, I want to say. Uh, he plays a Triple H deck. Uh, you go up 3 and 0 after that. Then in round four, you play Tom Scott and his Goldberg deck. Okay. Tom Scott was the lethal lottery winner. He was, uh, he was a local Dark Tower player. Gotcha. Uh, Yes, yeah, you close it out by saying it stunk to have to play a fellow Dark Tower player this early in the tournament. But you have to play to win if you come this far. <laughs> yeah, it's true. I, 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 you know, I think that is something that is definitely understated nowadays. If you're competing and you're playing for something, you play to win. Of course. And it's not like you it's can have – no, no, it's not personal. It's not uh, – you can have empathy for people – in their situations, but you got to do what you want to do to win, you know? Because you hate it when you got a guy who's just like, uh, you steamrolls like that. And obviously there's going to be some emotions in, in, when playing, even, a, you know, a card game. So I, but it's just something about what takes a guy to go like, to say, fuck it, and turn the table up and just, you know. I've had it <laughs> uh, so it says right here, you're somewhat relieved at this point and that you were confident in your Heat Seekers deck at that point. Because this is the end of all access. You go four and zero in all access. Now you got to go and play Afterburn next. So you're going to Afterburn. You're playing your Doink deck. You said so. It's a completely different style for you that you're normally used to playing. So how long? So you like to, you told earlier that you like to play a deck and have it prepared at least a month before you play in a tournament. Did you have that done be with Doink beforehand? I don't. I, so I don't recall. Uh, I, I think maybe there was stuff I was mulling in the Doink deck ahead of time that like uh i was go i was hemming and hawing between like playing jimmy and managed by regal uh managed by william regal because william regal would like get you uh like a uh, volley this or don't try this at home whatever card you needed to be in your opening hand that was significant and i felt that was more important than reversing the maneuvers with jimmy so that that became like i don't i don't remember when that the decision on that got made, but I remember that being probably like one of the most significant parts for me in the design process with it. But I, I mean, it's a small like pre-match part. Um, everything else, like the fact that you can, any, any superstar in the game that you can reduce costs very easily over time to play some, have no fortitude and play a 20 fortitude card. Yeah. You know, it's pretty awesome. Like in revolution undertaker, you know, like to have access to do stuff like that. Yeah. That's, pretty damn powerful in any game that was my second favorite deck in revolution was uh taker yeah and i think my third overall was uh elijah burke i just love the whole recursion process with him so uh, i've had epic battles playing uh revolution rick flair versus elijah burke like that <laughs> he becomes so hard to kill off you just keep recurring all the time um so then you get into the, you get into the, all, to the afterburn format so I, and you did a brief little uh write-up talking about how it's a different type of uh deck for you it's more of a control strategy to play uh and the whole point is to lock down your opponents like that you know gaining fortitude from your backstage area uh you know you get in a round one you play an edge deck you play a guy, a guy named james james bruckner okay and uh so he gets some UK guy? basically you locked him down pretty quick and you went at this point now you're five and up i feel very confident so after after all access at four and zero, oh, 
I think you're just like, oh, if I just go two and two, my tiebreaker should get me in. As long as I don't like just crap the bed big time, sure. you know, you're going to be okay. So there was a, there was a big sigh of relief after all access. Definitely. Yeah. You, you did. That, so you're somewhat relieved at this point. I says, uh, cause you were confident in your heat seeker decks like that, but you were more worried about how Doink would fare in the afterburn competition. Um, you know, with the, cause you made some recent changes to the deck. I guess you made some recent changes before you showed up to worlds in that deck. Uh, and didn't have a whole lot of heavy play testing on that, I guess. I'd have to go back up and read it again. There's a long part of it where you talked about, you know, uh, your desire to move away from Stacy and go into uh, Doink instead. Did you find this in the Wayback Machine? I sure did. Oh, that's, I'm so happy for something like that to exist. If you go into the October 06, October 2006, October 6, 2006, and you can go on to uh, reports like that, you'll find your report right there. Um, so you go five and oh now, you gotta be sitting pretty pretty at this point. You, know, so you just said four and oh, if you go two and two, you're great. Now you're already like five and oh. Uh, now you go in a round two, you're playing um, you know, a leader of the edge army. This looks like it was, um, this was a tough round for you because you lost this round. You lost the leader of the edge army. This is where you went five and one. Uh, you know, some people, you said, some people believe in curses and karma. So uh, some might say, and I'm one of those people, Elijah is an amazing player. I lost to him at Gen Con in the top four. Uh, I knew this was going to be a great game, you said. And he was doing chain route uh, with his amazing Leo the Edge army. Uh, and so it looks like, yeah, you ended up, uh, you, you got hit with a judo choke to throwback. Uh, the game was almost, I mean, you basically, it was almost at time. And then uh, you ended up losing that round just like that. Do you remember that at all? Do you remember losing a round like that? Was it, was it a, a confidence deflator? Uh, I mean, like, I still probably felt like I had a good cushion even after the loss just because of being 5-1. and one. But I think by the way that Doink deck was designed, if people were just jamming maneuver, maneuver, maneuver hard at it constantly, I feel, and they were like zero cost maneuvers or um, if they could get out of the – uh, doink plunging range, you know, or like putting stuff out of cost range, they're non zero fortitude cards. Mm -hmm. Then I think it might actually fold pretty easily. Uh, I, in a weird way, I probably, if even, you know, I'm happy with the results that happen, but I'd probably play something different other than doink. Uh, when thinking about this right now, just getting pummeled by maneuvers, it just seems like a bad decision of a deck to play. <laughs> Well, you rebounded strong. You went up against Anthony Escobar and playing his Hera Friends deck, which in itself, that's even, that's a pretty damn tough deck, uh, Superstar to play against. That too. Uh, but you end up going six and one at that point. Uh, so it says at that point, you should do that. You and uh, Rob, Rob uh, Malson, Maslin? Maslin, Maslin, Canadian. Both you guys are in top four because you end up actually talking about. Um, Again, I think it might have been Rob that you were hoping to finish facing the, the, the final, I think. I can't remember. I, or it might have been Mark. I got to go back. It's, it's a long read. I can't remember. Yeah, it's, a long, remember. it's a long read. Um, so you go against him as her friend. You, you, you win that one. Uh, then you go in and uh, you have to face uh, Frankie Ho in round four and facing his home team deck. Any, anything about that one at all? Because this is the guy I think that you were kind of most worried about facing, correct? Yeah, so I think it's there is a long write-up you had, a lo very long write-up about this match you had with him. So I don't uh, I don't know if I wrote about it in there, but I think from – now, my memory is very faint on this, so uh, it, it, it's, it's, it's really hard to recall, but I think – I can see at that time having the thought going, okay, it looks like I'm going to be in the top four and it looks like Frankie's going to be in the top four. Yep. So what, no matter what happens with this match, how can I use this to my advantage to gain more information about what he's doing without revealing as much about what I'm doing? And so may, I, I can see at a certain point just, um, and it's not an excuse of losing or anything of that sort, but the stakes that like, I'm not disincentivized as much to, to just lose there and gain information as opposed to 
Uh, let me just pummel him and show him certain power of the deck that he's not going to be aware of in the top four. So like, I can see that coming into play a little bit. I'm not saying it's heavy weighted. It's probably a small portion of it, but like th you can get to a certain point in a game based, if you know, you're still going deep in the tournament and competing for the prize, then you can give up a little bit once you're behind to gain more information. Yes. If, if your odds are low. You get past him, and then you face Mark in the semifinals. Mark, was it LaRoche? LaRoche, yeah. So basically you – Did I win Mark, against Frankie, or did I lose against Frankie? You you, uh, you won that round. Oh, geez. Uh, wait, hold on a second. Actually, you don't even give a list if you won. Uh, no, I think you did win that round. Okay. So, um, okay. The semifinals, you faced Mark, so, and you basically said, Mark and I wanted this to be the finals. But it didn't work out that way, the way we wanted to. We were both aware of the matchup and how to play them, primarily the Teddy and Doink matchup. So then there was a, a road dog. I guess you played a road dog? Uh, LaRoche played road dog as well, I think. So you get through him. You go into the finals. You play, uh, face Frankie. Now, Frankie's playing a deck. You said the year before you played Paul Heyman, right? Yeah. So now this year, he's playing Paul Heyman. Oh, so I'm pretty familiar with that deck. And, oh, uh, okay. So, yeah, I mean, you, Doink's you, ability can block him out. That, you thought Frankie knew about me dropping uh, Saskatoon, uh, the pre-match, early in the day, uh, but luckily he didn't. <laughs> he chose Edge. And, uh, yeah, so you went on. And then I guess you won that match because you, you didn't go a full three rounds with him. You only, you, you kind of won. Was it three rounds, right? Three rounds for Worlds? Finals? Yeah, uh, the finals. I think it was like you yeah, that's a three. one of each format. And then, yeah, I, I, I don't know if it was best of three for each format. No, no, or, best of three overall. Like uh, someone would pick the first round, then the second round, and then there was like uh, a coin Randomly top. decide so, the third. So, um in the first round, he plays uh, Paul Heyman. Uh, you win through that one. So now you're going to be feeling really good at this point because you're already like, you're basically one win away. So, oh, and that was for all access then. Just, okay. And then you, uh, uh, you face his home team deck. And that's how you won. Uh, you, you end up uh, pinning him for that one. It says right here uh, for the home team one. This time I have a strategy planned out since I know how his deck works now. I dropped a pre, uh, as much pre-match as needed uh, as Houston and old school psychology uh, emptied my hand. I dropped underrated Vince GRA and some other stuff. I go for a, manage, uh, a maneuver reversal uh, off of the Regal. Luckily, he doesn't get maneuvers uh, to, to really throw. I sit back and wait to reverse. Eventually, he gets pressure into playing, you feeling lucky throwback. Uh, multiple times where I end up playing a couple of takedowns. Cowboy Bob and then letting it through to reverse the maneuver for damage and the pin. Frankie's made a great run at two in a row. He played tough and I hope to see him next year. I think. Yeah. Go ahead. Sorry. No, I, th I think by that point, because uh, you have a lot more stuff that you've written out about certain matches, like certain matches as you go, you know, you come back, you write your reports like that. Certain matches really stand up in your mind. because You can see that, you know, the gameplay going on. It sounded like those last two matches against Frankie ended up being not overly challenging at that point though. I, I, I think this is, this is where, you know, when I was saying before, I think when I played Frankie uh, initially in the regular rounds, I felt like there was more information that I gained from him that helped me towards in the finals against him. I just couldn't re recall whether it was more of a uh, not showing your full hand or of now I understand your full game plan. Let me plan sure. more, a better, a better route compared to that. But it sounds like it was the plan towards the better route compared to him. So you win that, you know, you win, you win your, your 2006 champion, man. What, what did, what did you get for your spoils, man? What did you get? So I ended up getting a, uh, a spinner belt uh, that they had like a, a, a plate made, you know, they, they send uh, in for engraving to engrave the plate. Sure. Uh, so I ended up getting a spinner belt. Uh, part part of the the big prizes for Worlds wasn't necessarily winning it. Um, well, so, there was some cool aspects to it, but 
it was the trip to WrestleMania and hanging out with everyone during that time. It, it's, it's one of these, it's a different prize concept compared to other games where rather than just having the top one or two people really get a lot of stuff, they try to spread out the full experience and reward of getting to Worlds between everybody entered in it. Mm -hmm. So everybody would get WrestleMania tickets. So because of Raw Deal, I got to go see WrestleMania live three years in a row nice. uh, with, with decent seats and um, and just I'm having asking, basic I'm asking about that. How, what kind of seats did you guys get? I mean, it was basically, you know, not floor, but uh, second deck, like front second deck. That's so awesome. you had a really nice, nice view to it. And I, I mean, I remember that was right during the time when the Boo, C, the Cena Triple H Boo Yay chant at mania happened and I, it was like these things to be seeing wrestling are fun and entertaining but being at the live show in the experience of it, it it's it's a spectacle like you, you just you'll never experience again you know been there done that yep no I know that. <laughs> it's a lot of it's, it's a different thing when i take someone to a wrestling event for the first time uh it's like it's not what they were expecting and it's like yeah. wow this is like super entertaining even though i don't hear any commentating going on it's like that it's super entertaining and there's nothing like wrestlemania i mean it's like it's there's nothing like it now um, let, let me add also for this stuff because in the semifinals i had to face laroche mark laroche yeah. and he uh i i know for there was quite a few years there where we would see each other at least once a month and we lived states apart you know uh, and then there was another person, David Marks from Australia that would come up at times wow. and we would all like hang out and just goof around and be like, you know, just have fun. But at the same time, we would do some play tests and want to compete. And so like th there was a whole, I don't remember the exact conversation details, but there was definitely when you have friends and you're competing and you're both in the same event, you're not like completely shit talking, but you're also you're like trying to like uh, motivate each other in ways to be like, this can be like a huge moment yeah. in our lives, you know? Well, we've, we've talked about this before in some in other discussions we've had. I mean, uh, this is going to be, um, again, the first series of championship stuff, but I think it's going to be our eighth or, or ninth, eighth or ninth episode now um, where we've talked about how we can talk about all day long about mechanics of the game, certain releases, uh, championship runs uh what's your mental state what I mean, we can do all those kind of things like that yeah. but, but the bottom line that this game has really done for people and we've talked about it with uh when we talked about adam kreitz at our last one we had which was uh this game brought something to me that i think brought a lot of people that i never expected to me i, I went into it from a retail standpoint i still do it to this day but what's brought me that i did not expect was the friendships that i've developed over the years because of this game you know it, it's a it's a fun game. It's a simple, I mean, well, not simple in some respects, but it's a, it's a game. You don't realize that you're picking up these friendships that you've developed over the years. Yeah. Up until this moment, I've never met you before in my life. I've never spoken to you before, uh, but this game that for all these years has connected me to different people like that. And here you and I are talking about your run, what you did. And then you mentioned how you're hanging out with you're being 20 something year old. You're hanging out with friends. You're just, uh, there's memories you just don't, you can't, you'll never forget. And all because of a game. Yeah, it's, it's actually, um, you know, I've had some successes. They're not like mega, but they're not small. And in other card games with world championship runs and stuff like that. But you know, no matter what the success that happens, it's good to see yourself apply yourself and get results. That is a, a good thing to have. But at the end of the day, when I look back on those times, it's not even about the wins. It's not about the prizes. It's actually about the people that I spent the time with. Some of my closest friends that I have today are from Raw Deal. I was going to ask you, are there still people still you can speak with? with? Yeah. Yeah, on, on, on a weekly basis, you know. Uh, uh, and it's, it's, it's one of those things that you're like, you realize that the – the love and effort that you put into a community is uh, an acceptance, uh, accepting other people just for who they are, mm -hmm. uh, no matter the good or the bad, but like 
who the person is just as another human being. And you, and I found that in the gaming community, a lot of the times you just have a lot of open hearted, accepting people who are looking for a place to belong and spend time together. You want it to be and that's, in, that's in, what all I game, in all games. You think that, that is? Yeah. It, it, I mean, in most games to different levels, but in raw deal, it was, and when you have a large community that is to a, a drastic amount, a drastic majority of them are like that, it becomes an amazing thing. You know, there's uh, uh, Steve Resk. I haven't talked to him in a while. I talked to him once in a blue moon, but he's been, he's been doing an SRG super show, mm -hmm. uh, dice rolling card game. And um, I, I looked into just seeing what he was doing community wise. Mm -hmm. And I can see reflections of what the raw deal community back in the day of that experience in what he is providing nowadays. So I actually, I see a, a reflection of Baron mm -hmm. of what Baron provided to us of what Steve's doing for that community nowadays, That's which awesome. is, it's beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. So, I, I, I communicated with him in the past about, uh, for the game as well. It's like that. Uh, it's, I find it to be a very fun game. Uh, yeah. And so seeing how what he's, what he's cultivating with players like that, you're getting very involved and being very like people coming up. And I noticed that too with Rod Deal. Guys would come up and, and, and dress up in gimmick, you know. And, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That was always, fun. I mean, that's not me. I'm not that kind of guy, but it was always fun to see someone come as like as Davari, you know, and someone, someone come as Hulk Hogan and someone, and then play those characters. It's like, a, it, to each other, yeah, I, and I, I have no knock against that, you know. I mean, there's, uh, I, I'm, I'm actually thinking of like, ways to make the experience better now and it's just some people naturally have that baked into them uh, of how to make a moment even better by accenting with an outfit or a costume and yeah. I, i'm a little slow in that in that department <laughs> you and me both <laughs> you and me both uh it's 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 been it's been a fun ride with rod Dialog, which still goes today and you know virtual continues to keep the game going uh despite like any other game like you're not going to please everybody no matter what yeah. It's just yep. not going to happen. So we're going to, uh, you know, F virtual. I don't like the this format. I don't like that. I don't like this kind of wording. You're never going to please everybody. But the underlying core here is that virtual has still kept a game that hasn't been in print <laughs> since 2007, still alive, still desirable, still wanted, and still bringing people together to want to play a game, a wrestling game um, that just, it's a lot of fun in, in most ways. It yeah, really I, I, I think uh, some, some of the thoughts on that, uh, there's a couple things. Um, I know this is going to sound self-serving ego-wise, but part of, part of the prize for winning Worlds that year was you get to design a card in a future set. Yes. And uh, that's what For the Love of the Game was. And a lot of the times, what I would hear either from – Foley, uh, or through customers, players in the game who play a little bit, but not enough, or we're struggling with getting fortitude or getting into the game and just enjoying the experience. So that was a big part. And so like, what do you want to do for the love of the game? Okay. I want to take out the negative play experiences that exist. And what, how, how are we going to do that? Okay. Let's help the people ease into getting fortitude. As long as I felt that I got five to 10 fortitude in every game, it didn't matter what the result was. I felt like I had a chance. Mm -hmm. So it's like, let's get people get some fortitude into the game, you know? And that, that's what the design of that card became. But then you, you start going in, you're like, okay, well, some people like different formats because they enjoy it more or it's easier. Uh, I shouldn't say easier, but it's more, um, it's more built into the design to make sure you get fortitude or get to feel like we get a back and forth experience. No matter, as long as we get that back and forth, that's really all that matters. Yeah. I mean, the result is gonna happen whatever way. It doesn't matter the result. It's just that we get to have that experience. I was gonna ask you about that, so I, cause I know that uh, Winter got to design a card. So for the love of the game is what you designed? Yeah, so there was most of it, th that was the idea that I spoke of to Baron and Foley of like, I just want people to be able to get in and play the game uh, and not get, red walled out that's part of why volley this couldn't reverse it but then uh you know other splash in designs on it came on um and i think you know they recommended certain ideas 
And then I kind of like tweaked it a certain way. But then I think Baron really wanted to have something that uh, bulleted. So a big uh, one thing you, if you ever noticed in the design process was that they would usually release something pretty powerful. And then a set or two later, they would make a bullet that would kind of like nullify it or yeah. calm it down. And so uh, it's all about the game was taken off pretty big at the time and uh, still for a while. And so he wanted to kind of neuter that a little bit. And that's what that discard effect uh, drawing, if it got discarded, came from. And then getting early fortitude, just if you want to do the pre-match phase or later on in the game. It's still a go-to card for a majority of decks to this day, even in virtual. It's good. It's good. It's good. It's job then. Yeah, it's, it's doing its job. It's doing it's a great card. It's like that. Uh, I've taken advantage of it myself on many <laughs> different decks. Like yeah. that. But to, I, again, I, I came in late in the game. You guys have been playing a long ass time. So I, and you guys have this mindset. It's like when you guys are playing these games, uh, and I was talking with Drew about it. Uh, he brought up, it's, it's like playing chess. Yeah. And I, I, I'm not a chess player. so like that. That's probably why I'm not as successful at raw deal as a lot of people. But um, do you approach it that way? Is it a chess game to you? Uh, in in ways it is. I think I think uh, from what we realized uh, through the years playing Raw Deal was if you if you could memorize the card catalog that every superstar if you had it you know memorized what specifics they have. Okay, so what are the cards I have to play around? Like if I'm playing against Eddie Guerrero, uh, is there a way I can play around Ultimo Rocaso the whole game? If I can do that, awesome, because then his cards nullified or uh, maybe I don't want to play around it, but let me make sure I have uh, raw or SmackDown pick a brand, you know, just these different things. So you figure out the medicals of how you're supposed to play around certain stuff. And, and it just became like RTC. I don't want to play. I I'm ahead in fortitude. I'm not playing another maneuver. Sorry, buddy, you know, <laughs> or just play big show when RTC was huge so that everybody's going half hour suplex. It only does three damage. Yeah. There's, there's all these different like leveling plays that you can do, but it's more so, uh, playing around, uh, predicting what your opponent's going to do next or in that range. And then that kind of crosses over into a lot of card games, even in poker. Like, what do, what do I think that you think that I think I'm doing? You know, like <laughs> these, these weird, like, or, you know, uh, the princess bride. Exactly. Well, if, if you... <laughs> exactly what I was thinking, too. Exactly what I was thinking. Uh so 07 becomes the end of comic images doing stuff, the end of 07. Um, and then we got 08. Uh, how did the game not, no longer be in, pro, in production anymore? How did that affect you? Did you were you still playing? Do you, when did you stop playing on a regular basis? Because you just told me before we started recording here today, you said that uh, you, know, you just started kind of getting back into it not too long ago. So I kind of picking up a few pieces here and there to kind of, uh, I think at one time building a cube. But then, yep. um, you know, when did you get back into it? What made you stop and when did you get back into it? So uh, after winning Worlds that one year, it had already qualified me for the next year. Mm -hmm. So I wasn't doing any qualifiers that whole year. And in a weird way, like, you know, the competitor in you goes, oh, I don't have to qualify for next year. I'm good. I'm set. I'll just start preparing two months before it. But what actually got lost in that process was a lot of the socialization experience. Like I'm not talking about just the dark tower. I'm talking about when traveling and going to events and socializing, that was, that was the highlight, you know, and I didn't get that as much. So there was a little bit of a lull of an emotion there, mm -hmm. but um, excuse me. And then uh, after that world's the 2007 one, I remember, you know, there was the whole revolution thing that occurred. Revolution got, uh, put into existence. There yeah. was a, a big uh, uh, lash back against it, if you will. And um, I, you know, there's, there's this one thing that I've always had in my mind that I do want to share that yeah. it's, there's no knock towards anybody or anything. And it's not Bring uh, out the dirt, bring out the dirt. <laughs> so there was when revolution three was being play tested. I think that I think they had gotten to the end of the show and they hadn't figured out how to, that if, if the license was being renewed or not, but it seemed there was one thing that Baron did that made me go, I think the game's over. And it was in play testing. Uh, Mudrummy, uh, I, I'm terrible with his name. The, the from Singapore, 
Yeah, uh, you know, Rumi bin Mode or something like that. Yes, yes. I, I apologize. I don't mean to butcher a name. Yeah, I, I don't either. So like that. <laughs> so and, I asked you to introduce yourself. I wasn't going to pronounce it. <laughs> <laughs> so his card that he made that ended up being Revolution My Way yep. was going to be called, the title in the playtest document was Revolution, the last raw deal champion ever. Oh. And, and I, I remember messaging, because you'd give feedback on certain cards, and I'd go, Baron, is this the last set of Raw Deal or are we changing the title so that we're not putting out the idea that the game's over? You know, and I didn't know whether the game was still going or not at that point, after that point. But it was something that always stuck with me. And I was just like, I feel like they knew, you know, towards the end of that year. I'm not saying they did anything malicious or secretive or, you know. No, but it's a, it, it becomes a licensing uh, issue between Comic Images and, uh, and WWE. And, uh, you know, those neg negotiations take place months before they make an announcement anyways. So it's so, not like they just woke up one day and they went, oh, we're done. <laughs> so to continue into, like, what happened getting back into the virtual stuff a little bit was after Rod Deal died, I shouldn't say died, after Rod Deal... Um, These print, you know, it's no longer in print. Was no longer in print. Uh, I, I transitioned with a group of the friends from Raw Deal into the WoW TCG. We played that probably till like 2011, 2012. Another amazing community had a great time. And then that game stopped printing. And so I went like a year or two without heavy gaming. I would try to. So like something was missing in the gaming atmosphere of my life and, you know, other social aspects. So it was just like, ah, let me look into it, you know, and I started looking, and so I ended up going to Gen Con, and I was car riding with Pat Eschke, who also played Raw Deal, uh, as well as the WoW TCG, and on the car ride back from Gen Con, I was dropping off in, like, Pittsburgh, we were just talking about, you know, there's these, these cubes for all these other games, Raw Deal doesn't have a cube, you know, what, we should maybe make a cube, like, this would be fun, like, even if we only see each other once every couple years, yep. if we have a cube ready, we get to play Raw Deal a couple more times in our lives and a yeah. good experience. So then it became like theory crafting and working on how the cube would function. And then, and then it became a hybrid of, we wanted to play a limited format where you just draft it. Like if you open packs and draft it, mm -hmm. this raw draft experience for raw deal, even though it was fun, it was not really well balanced, nor there was way too much variance. Like I said, there was only one elbow to the face. So we worked on, on that idea, just hashing it out. And then it became like, a couple friends in the area and the Allentown guys just playing some games and rescuing them, giving some feedback. And I'm just being like, cool, we got an idea for a cube. Now we can play raw deal without, uh, you know, um, and it's not to, because there's cubes that have virtual cards in them too, you know, mm -hmm. like you could do the virtual cards. in sure. them. So it's, it's, it's a different experience. It's a lot of replay value. And, um, but so that, that leaped me into getting, paying attention to more of the virtual stuff. So then I, I reached out to like you and carte blanche hobbies uh, to like pick up some cards and then start building the cube. And then you fill in little holes here yeah. and there. Uh, that was the gist of hopping back in. If, uh, you know, we live in a really weird world right now. So it's really, um, <laughs> shit is upside down right now. Yeah. Uh, but in It'll 2021, let's say uh, things take back to some kind of a, a normal. Um, I know the guys up in your area, I think like Luke, Luke Lash like that, has done okay. an incredible job of, uh, you know, trying to create a, a play group environment up there. Had a pretty successful tournament, I think last year, um, yeah, last year, uh, up in that area. I don't know what the turnout was, but it was more than he expected, which I, I it's, it's a good sign. So in 2021, think about anything that would make you want to come back and play again? So, I, I know I've heard a couple people talk about like prizes and stuff because obviously incentives are always going to drive people. Yeah. So like maybe it's a, a, a change of ways for the future of understanding the values of what the best incentives really are that are non-monetary and, and trying to tap that in to the game of virtual. And even if this isn't in cards, you know, whatever else life experiences just tap into that. So if there's a way to make, community felt experience of what people really want to get out of virtual. I think that's the avenue. What and do you think that might be? Uh, you know, the, 
uh, so just small little things like uh, even in the Canadian qualifier there, I won. Our finals was in a bar, you know, after outside of the convention center. It's a small thing. It's not like a, a, a I'm not saying a bar is the, the way we got to go with anything, sure. but some new way where you're going to have fun with the experience of others to make it memorable, you know, where you're like, I didn't expect that to happen. And I remember this moment that I had with you here on this earth. And that's what I'm going to remember for a long time. What can you do to make that happen? It's not going to be the money. It's not going to be the prizes is what I'm saying. Yeah. Cause I, I brought up the point about like, you know, is it worth me? Cause I, I've gotten a lot of autographs because of my other business affords me the luxury of working with a lot of different talent. So I've got pretty nice. I've gotten a lot of things signed uh, over the years on those backstage autograph session cards that they made for virtual. Um, and I've got plenty of blank still to take care of. I'm like, is it really worth my time to go out and get more stuff signed? You know, I can probably even get current talent to go get signed some stuff for me right now. But, you know, is it really worth that? Do people well, care keep, about that? Yeah, keep, keep in mind, listen, I have uh, a different viewpoint on things. And it may not be something people agree with. It may be something people agree with. It doesn't matter, you know, if we want to be a democracy and if the majority opinion rules, then if a lot of people want it, those autographs and that's the best thing, if there's the way to make it worth your time to get them that, if that's the case, mm -hmm. then so be it. But if it's worth, if it's not worth your time to do it, you know, that it, it needs, people's time needs to be respected. Well, people don't uh, value time a lot, I, I don't think. But my, my original point to ask you about for like 2021 is if someone were to hold an event, say someone like Luke was going to have a big event next year, there's talk about the uh, the North American Championship, basically. Um, uh, would it be something you'd want to come come to? Uh, depending on the location and what my commitments are at the time, I'd see it's 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 possible for me to do it. It's not me. Say, that's not me saying no. That's not me saying yes. Definitely, it's just uh, you know life does throw you curveballs. So I I couldn't. I can't make a commitment to something that isn't in stone yet for me, sure. you know, well, but I, the, I, event, the event itself isn't even in stone. So, <laughs> yeah. But if, if there was something where like, uh, just the idea of, if I know that, Hey, there's going to be this uh, virtual raw deal get together by the community. And I think there's going to be a really exciting, positive experience out of it to just enjoy the time together. It can be worth my time. Yeah, that's what uh, I've been asked. I took the, um, uh, you know, after Adam Christ passed away, we started an event called the Adam Christ Memorial Tournament or the ACMP, oh. um, where we get, got together, the funds were brought in, people would pay an entry fee to get in so like that. And then basically we would don donate that money to the city of Hope Cancer Research Center. So you were- That's awesome. Nothing you're getting out of it other than the prize support that I would throw. A lot of it came from Adam's stuff that I inherited, DVDs, uh, other kinds of knickknacks. I- at the time, I inherited a comic book store that was run by Rob Van Dam. And uh, when it went out of business, I inherited all of that. Uh, so I gave away a lot of that stuff. There was all these replica belts. and I'd give them away as prizes, uh, signed pay-per-view chairs, things like that. Whatever it was to get people to come in and want to play. So that's what they came in for, for some prizes. But mostly it's just to come in and have some fun, shoot the shit, you know, talk some smack, and see how everybody was doing, then come back again next year maybe and play. Have some fun. Yeah. Have some fun. Bottom line is to have some fun. So maybe last... something on TCO, maybe something on TCO where they put up a, a like, Hey guys, listen, everybody that still plays, what do you want out of it? What do you want? So maybe we can get an idea The people who are still wanting to experience it, what we can do to like make the experience overall together. Good. I, I agree. I mean, uh, I, I took, I took last year off of prize supporting from uh, Gen Con. It's the first year in, in 10 years, 11 years, I, I didn't uh, prize support. And kind of you know glad that i didn't and but also i think the people who would have played had i been more involved in it a little bit uh what i didn't tell anybody at the time was uh i have certain talent that i work with that work directly with wwe and the, and the goal was to probably kind of bring back the old comic images era the stuff like i was going to work on getting a grand prize a, a ticket to wrestlemania wow uh, and i could have made that happen but um i don't know that's something that somebody would want to happen you know still it's it's just in a weird place right now at Raw Deal. It's still a very heavily played game, but what does it do to bring a community together to want to play? I, yeah. I've been asked that as to bring that as a subject, and maybe it'd be you. Uh, maybe we can get uh, multiple people at the same time talking about uh, 
what does it take to grow a community? Like, especially nowadays, what does it take to grow a community who wants to play this game? Yeah, there's, it, it's, you know what the thing is at the heart of it? You gotta either, you gotta want to do it. You gotta put in the time and the work. And uh, there, there has to be people there who want, who want to be involved in that process. And it's, it's a lot, there is a lot of work and time involved. And I, I did the response to someone this morning before you and I jumped on here where I said that it, it really is a doable thing but somebody has to devote their time and energy and sometimes money to, you know, make it happen. If that's something you really want to make happen, it'll happen. This, this is why, you know, I think I, I listened to one episode before. I think you talked, somebody mentioned, I think it may, maybe it was Nate, something about like a Mount Rushmore of raw deal. Sure. And, you know, I'm not excluding anybody intentionally or anything like that, but there's only two faces that I see on that Mount Rushmore right now. And it's barren. And it's Creed. And it's primarily, you know, there's no knock towards anybody else, but primarily like the amount of time and sacrifice and effort to design in that process and to the community. Correct. I, I agree with you 100% on that. Because yeah. those two are, are, are automatics. Uh, I think everything else, the other two spots, when you talk about yeah. a Mount Rushmore, is subjective to anybody's, you know, yep. opinion, I guess. But those two are automatics. That yep. should be like first round ballot hall of famers right there no, no exactly problem. exactly yeah so I, I totally agree with that um yeah I, I think that's about what i have man i mean that's a, a lot more than i expected to have a <laughs> talk with but uh, uh again a, a game that without this game i don't know if you and i would ever cross paths <laughs> yeah yeah but you know what it's awesome i love what you're doing keep doing it you know make it worth your time what you want out of it you know i, I also look forward because, to other wrestling card stuff i i enjoy it um more than I thought I was going to. This is not my forte. So doing stuff in front of a camera is not my thing. Um, I say I have a face for radio. So um, <laughs> I, I, and for me, it's a, it's just to get over my discomfort of being in front of a camera. One, um, I'm generally a very fast talker. So it's it's to help kind of control my speech a little bit. Uh, my wife seems to think that it's uh, it's really good for me. She supports me in doing this. So that's there's awesome. that too. I, I don't want to disappoint her. Um, but uh, it's also to talk about things that we kind of all at one point uh, really was a part of our lives. It's still very much part of my life, obviously, because I'm a retailer. But um, it's just uh, it's, it's fun to talk about. Um, and I like to kind of expand this on other things now because my, I got into this because of trading cards. I was a wrestling trading card collector and seller. Now, my oldest card is from 1888. Uh, and then oh. I got into raw deal because I treated like trading cards. I've told the story many times before, but the quick version of it is, you know, I've gotten the vengeance. I opened up my first box. I got a hot pack out of it. Uh, one of those cards was a paid late in May. No idea what to sell it for. So a guy says, uh, how much? I said, five bucks for guys, eight bucks for girls, like trading cards. So I sold a paid late in May for $5. Uh, yeah, it's worth a little bit more than that. Yeah, but... no, no clue. I, I realized later because it was Baron, Baron who taught me how to play the game properly at uh, Gen Con Anaheim. And uh, that's when Battle Bag came out. Um, and so, uh, you know, I learned and kind of fell in love with it, not only being a wrestling related theme type of stuff, but as a card game going, this is actually kind of fun. I really hope it's not translate into Pokemon because I cannot fucking do that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so it just, um, it's been a lot of fun. And this uh, YouTube channel thing, which is kind of like, one, I got nothing else to do. I'm a stay at home dad now. Uh, <laughs> So, and it's pandemic, so, you know. Stuff to do. You know, my child's going to take a nap right now. But um, just to do this, it's kind of, you know, spiraled into something else I didn't expect. Like, I never expected to have a champion series. Like, hey, that'd be kind of cool. Let's go back and check out all the champions like that and see if those guys are interested. Like, and I go on uh, Wikipedia and go, holy shit, someone had all the virtual era world champions, too. I'm like, I got a lot of people to talk to. This is awesome. And yeah, I think that's great. Get get them on here. Talk about their history. Whatever their experience. Everybody's got a different experience. Exactly. You can learn and see different things from people's playing of cards, competing. If there's something there, if we can recall it. I struggled with it a bit today. I was trying to. Don't, please don't be offended. It's just hard to recall. But uh, and then then let alone what they had for their community experience. Absolutely. That's probably because the biggest the, part. The, the one commonality, like we again, kind of beating a dead horse here, is that it just it it brings friendships together I mean, that's what it is we all have our different paths of things that we've done we all have a different uh in our areas and our different friends and playing this game and like you said, our different experiences 
but the one commonality from everybody from Chile, UK, Singapore, Canada, US, everywhere is that it developed friendships. It yeah. just developed friendships. Even if it's like I'm friends with somebody, you know, from Chile just because of this game. I may have never met this person in my life, but in this format, because of technology, I'm like a little bit closer to shaking that guy's hand, you know? <laughs> <laughs> So it's just, uh, it's really cool. And uh, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep doing it as long as people want to see it and hear it. You know, I know these tend to run a little longer. My wife keeps saying, you need to kind of shorten them down. A little <laughs> long. But we, we, get, we get going on our tangents, you know, we get going on our things and talk about things. And we have a lot of uh, pride, a lot of, uh, you know, uh, energy about what we're talking about. So it's just, uh, it's fun. It's just fun. Thank you for making it happen. Yeah, I just uh, thanks for taking part of it. It's like that. I may uh, tap into you for uh, something else. If you had a release, that you were, you knew frontwards and backwards. Okay. What release would that be? Maybe we would do a, a, a set breakdown. Oh, um, yeah, so forwards and backwards, I mean. I mean, like, you know. I'm trying you know, to think off the top of my head here. It's, it's uh, I, I mean, the heyday for us was probably like the RS10 era, you know, Absolute Raw, Ultimate Smackdown. Yeah. That's when Stephanie took over uh, that era. I know that in Divas Overload, that whole era changed a lot of stuff, how things was done. So somewhere in that range probably. Now, I, I, I might not know everything about that stuff in regards to what happened in the playtesting because I wasn't involved then. Sure. But like, uh, well, my original idea was to break every set down about every little nuance about a set. And then after doing the Great American Bash one, we were done. I was like, holy shit, there was a whole, so many questions to ask, you know, about other stuff. I didn't talk about fan favorites or cheater cards, even though they weren't introduced then. But we didn't talk about this or that. And then I started seeing Creed's post up on TCO about the cutting room floor. I go, that is it right there. That's a whole discussion I could probably have with just probably Creed to talk about all the things that were on the cutting room floor. Uh, and so it didn't have to be part of Great American Bag. didn't have to be part of Velocity. Didn't, I mean, just we can just break down a set of what it is and then maybe do a whole separate episode of just talking about all the cutting room floor stuff. Yeah, I, I wouldn't mind hopping on at times. Also, I do think that, uh, and I know Creed, we do have to respect Creed's time because if, if he was stepping down from doing so much for the virtual for so long, I can understand how time consuming that can be and him wanting his time. But, sure. you know, I do think Creed is like the new Baron. If, if you will. And I don't I'm surprised that, that uh, I still I'll message him once in a while through Facebook. And uh, he's uh, always been good to me and uh, providing information to me. It's like that. Uh, willing to answer my questions. Yeah. And uh, he's been kind of really into doing these. Like this will be his, uh, awesome. this Saturday will be his third one to be on with me so far now to talk about stuff. Well, I look forward to it. Yeah. And uh, I'm going to have Nate on with him as well. So the three of us. So uh, again, Nate was the first time I, my, he was my very first episode with, with Nate and I had never met the guy in my life and couldn't have been like yourself. Couldn't have been a nicer guy. It was just, uh, good dude. it good was, dude. Uh, it was awesome. So I appreciate your time, man. I really do. And um, I hope we can do something again, you know, talk about some other subject that you want. Sounds good. Sounds right, good. Man. You take care of yourself. All right. Take it easy. You